Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Trinity Sunday, June 7th, 2020. I'm your uh, lay reader, ruling elder, Zach Cosner. I ask that you turn your attention to the announcements that can be found on the back of your bulletin. The bulletin itself can be found at our website, www.centralprespb.com, under the publications link. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, you can find a link to the bulletin in the description underneath this video. For the church announcements, we will continue online worship services throughout the month of June. We miss all of you and pray that we see each other face to face soon. Uh, this week is the 100th episode of the CPC podcast, where we share church news and let you catch this week's sermon if you missed it. We try to post it on Sunday afternoons. If you're interested, you can head to our website and click the CPC podcast link under the publications menu, or you can look for the CPC podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or the Stitcher app. The Presbytery of Arkansas has canceled both summer youth trips for junior high kids and for senior high youth, uh, but the Synod of the Sun is offering an online youth workshop July 13th through 17th. Registration is free and will include a free t-shirt for participants. The Presbytery of, uh, is, of Arkansas is also offering to cover the $100 cost of Montreat at Home July 20th through 24th. Both events will take place online and it is for rising ninth graders to graduated seniors and interested adult leaders. If you have interested youth in either event, please contact me via social media or through the church website. Ferncliff is offering a camp in a box uh, for uh, churches and for individuals. It provides five days worth of activities that are screen free, encourage outdoor activity and minimize demands on parents. If you're interested in camp in a box, limited supplies are available. They are running out. I uh, got told uh, at the Presbytery meeting this weekend, uh, please head to Ferncliff's website if you want to claim one where it provides pricing information. Ferncliff.org is their website. Archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and YouTube. Links to each are also found on our website. Let us prepare to worship the Lord. The God of heaven has made his home on earth. Christ dwells among us and is one with us. Highest in all creation, he lives among the least. He journeys with the rejected and welcomes the weary. Come now, all who thirst, and drink the water of life. Come now, all who hunger, and be filled with good things. Come now, all who seek, and be warmed by the fire of love. We claim that we have no sin. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let, our, let us confess our sins to God, first using the prayer printed in the bulletin, and then silently. <clears throat> God of grace, love, and communion, we confess that we have failed to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We ignore your commandments, stray from your way, and follow other gods. Have mercy on us. Forgive our sin and raise us to new life that we may serve you faithfully and give honor to your holy name, now silently. Amen. As people born of water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the first chapter of the, verse, uh, of the book of Genesis, beginning with the first verse. 
<clears throat> and proceeding through the first half of the fourth verse of chapter 2. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, <clears throat> and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that he were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. <coughs> and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. <clears throat> and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind, and it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, 
I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude, and on the seventh day God finished the work that he had begun. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. We turn now to our second reading from the 28th, gospel of the court, uh, 28th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, <clears throat> beginning with the 16th verse and proceeding through verse 20. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them with the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. It is a bold confession of faith to affirm that God is creator. I think the boldness comes in acknowledging that we are mere creatures of the creating God. We are not masters of our own fate. In modern times, the first chapter of Genesis has been widely used in the argument over science's Big Bang Theory and the dispute between evolution and creationism and in any, in, and in any number of other conflicts between science and faith. Interestingly, though, proponents of such a view never truly get beyond the surface and deal with the ramifications of what it means to assert that we are all created in God's image. And because we are created in God's image, we should all act accordingly in our work, in our leisure, in public, in private, and with every one of our dealings with everybody else. In the present climate of grief and anger over the homicide of another young black man by police officers, in the cries for justice for jo George Floyd by those who are protesting peacefully, in the undeniable truths that the minority communities in this country have been far more affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, both physically and economically, I cannot help but wonder if many of the pressing issues of our day might have been completely avoided or averted had the men and women who sailed here to establish colonies where they might worship God as they saw fit truly taken to heart what it means to say not only that God created us all, but also that each and every one of us bears the image of God. Might the stain of 400 years of racism 
have been prevented. I couldn't help but think about such things as I read and studied and watched the images of a nation in pain on broadcast news this past week. I am more convinced than ever that knowing where we come from, knowing who and whose we are, is key to understanding what has been graciously entrusted to us and what is expected from us. Maybe that's why every single culture and civilization has a story about the beginning of things. The Eskimos tell how the first man kicked his way out of the pea pod, dropped through a hole in the bottom, and went off to find something to eat. The Chinese tell the story of Fan Ku, a creating giant who burst forth from a universe shaped like a chicken's egg. The Blackfoot Indians believe that the world was <clears throat> fashioned by an old man who walked from south to north, making things as he went. In Iceland, there is a story of a frost giant named Amir, who sweated into existence the first man and woman from his armpit. One of the prevailing stories of creation in the ancient world was the Babylonian Enuma Elish. That story tells of a war between two gods, Marduk and Tiamat. Marduk prevailed against Tiamat and slayed her. Her body was then used to create the earth and all living things. And as a result of this understanding, the ancient Babylonians worshipped anything and everything. Every force in nature had a name and a god attached to it. Everything which existed was seen as an appropriate object of worship. It was into this mix that the account of creation we read this morning came into being. Now, tradition has long held that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. But biblical scholarship today points to a number of different writers, both of Genesis and the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. And I make mention of this only because it is now widely believed by biblical scholars that the creation account in the first chapter of Genesis was actually written by a group of priestly writers during the time of the Babylonian exile. Take a moment and let that thought sink in. Imagine a people utterly defeated in battle and absolutely demoralized by the shame of exile. And into that shame and chaos came the story of creation, which was nothing short of a defiant call to remember that it was God who created them and that this God had not abandoned them. When we read the creation account in this context, it is an act of sheer boldness. Because in Babylon, one of their most important gods represented the two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. And because these rivers were known for their fierce floods, the Babylonian people possessed a great deal of fear for the particular god represented by these rivers. But the account of Genesis boldly asserts that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. God was not frightened or threatened by the chaos and confusion which the waters represented. The Hebrew, in fact, almost gives the reader the sense that God was dancing on the face of the waters. Imagine in our present circumstances as a church and as a nation, the good news behind the assertion that God is neither threatened by nor overcome by the prevailing chaos. Instead, God is present 
in this moment, breathing order and righteousness, justice and peace over the face of the troubled waters. Throughout the creation account, the greatness and sovereignty of God are established. Time and time again, we are presented with one image and one image only, that only God is worthy of worship. Only God has the power to create. Only God has the authority to bring life into being or to destroy. Only God is master of the universe. There are no other gods. And that message about God remains the same for us as it did for our ancient forebears. Just as it was back then, the religious life of humanity remains a chaos of idolatry. There is nothing that is not worshipped today. Some worship fame, some worship money, some worship success, some worship themselves and their own understandings of the world. <clears throat> Our worship today may take different forms now, but people persist in finding ways to worship the creature instead of the creator. As a result, we all need to be reminded time and again about God and God's greatness and mercy, lest we find our lives to be little more than a formless void. We all need to be reminded in our suffering that God can and does create order out of chaos. We all need to hear that God can give substance to the emptiness we feel in our lives. And like the priestly writers in Babylon, we are being called to tell the world of the sovereignty, the love, and the grace of God. We are called to proclaim that only God is worthy of praise. We are commissioned to tell the world that Jesus saves. We are empowered to inform the world that God's Spirit strengthens us all. In the course of this past week, an image I saw on more than one occasion was that of elected leaders, both Republican and Democrat, holding up a Bible or referring to the Bible in our present chaos. Democrats were quick to point out how President Trump used it only as a prop or a photo op. But what they failed to recognize is that they were no better in their use of or reference to the Bible. The current Democratic-controlled House of Representatives has been in power for nearly two years. Where have they been on issues of justice and equality? They talk a good talk, but there has been no action on their part to make any lasting change. Quite frankly, I'm offended by both political parties, as we all should be to claim the moniker of and use the writings and symbols of Christianity and to act in anything other than Christian ways that exhibit love and justice for all is an affront to everything our Lord called us to be and to do. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Jesus told his disciples in our reading from Matthew. Those words, commonly known as the Great Commission, are the summary of the church's mission and ministry in this and every age. But if we were to take an honest look at our lives, it would appear that rather than hearing these words as a commission, we prefer to think of them as merely a good suggestion. Go, our Lord tells us. That is the same voice that told Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. 
It is the same voice that said to Moses, go, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. It's the same voice that said to Isaiah in the temple, go and say to this people. Now this voice, the voice of God, speaks through the risen Christ to the disciples to say once again, go. And what are we to do when we go? We are to make disciples of all nations. Notice this is no, this isn't some sort of hit and run evangelism. The disciples are sent to do hard work. We're not to hurl leaflets into the wind or hold a rally in a stadium. We are called to the harder and much less glamorous work of making disciples, of building Christian communities. A disciple, of course, is a student. And the task of the church before us is to help others become students of God's will. We are to go out to the nations not as an army of occupation, but as a humble tutor teaching mercy and righteousness, forgiveness, and peacemaking. And like the creation account itself, this is a bold message requiring bold messengers. Because going out into the world threatens to take us out of our comfort zones. When we enter the pain and sorrow of others, it means that we may well get hurt in the process. When we call and work for justice in society, it may mean rubbing elbows with the poorest, dirtiest, and smelliest people that we can imagine. To make disciples of all nations, cultures, and races means we may very well find ourselves among people who look, dress, and act nothing like us. But it is a mission our Lord took very seriously. It's a mission we are called and commissioned to take just as seriously. I'm reminded of something that John Brown, a 19th century Scottish theologian, said when he remarked, Holiness does not consist in mystic speculations, enthusiastic fervors, or uncommanded austerities. Rather, holiness consists in thinking as God thinks and willing as God wills. That, too, is a bold message. How many of us will be bold enough to carry that message into our present world? To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which we'll be taking electronically this week by going to our website, www.centralprespb.com and using the Donate Now link found at the top of the webpage. You can also mail your check-in to Central Presbyterian Church, 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. 
For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life, and your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you, you, for you to use as you see fit until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, we will uh, share our joys and concerns. Uh, first, I will um, say a, um, a note of gratitude for you excusing my uh, form of dress this week. Um, I lost track of time uh, running errands and was not able to go get my proper church attire before I was uh, needed to come down to the church and do my recording this week. So I apologize for the way I am dressed and will try to do better in the future. Um, I also wanted to also uh, say a note of thanks to Miss Betty Coles, who uh, last week came by the church and put out the um, Pentecost um, garments on the uh, podium. And throughout the church, you, you were not able to see it, because obviously because this is video, but uh, she did also adorn the, um, the communion table and the lay leader stand. Um, she came in this week and put uh, down our whites for Trinity Sunday, and I wanted to... Uh, take a moment and say thanks to Miss Betty. Um, also, uh, I spoke to Jessica a um, uh, couple uh, last night, and uh, Jessica asked us for prayer for her voice. Um, she is not sick, but she has lost her voice. She could barely talk on the phone. So she has asked us to um, at, pray for her voice. That's Miss Jessica Munn. Um, the, she also asked us to uh, keep her in prayer. Uh, she had a, some medical tests done last week. Uh, she is expecting um, the test results sometime around the 20 or 21st. Uh, so if you would please keep uh, her in prayer for good test results, she would appreciate it. Uh, Dana Neal asked for prayer for her father who is having medical issues. She also asked for prayer for her goddaughter, uh, Kara Taylor. Uh, she had her sec a second brain surgery this past Tuesday and is resting, resting comfortably, I, be I do believe. Um, but if you would please keep her in your prayers, we would appreciate it. Um, at this time, there is predicted to be a hurricane headed towards Arkansas. Um, so we need to keep everyone in the uh, hurricane's path in Louisiana here in the, um, I believe it's going to um, suffer the brunt of it on the uh, eastern side of the state of Arkansas when it gets here uh, sometime on Monday. Uh, so we need to keep everyone in our prayers for uh, that event coming soon. Uh, we also want to keep our prayers uh, for those who are dealing with COVID-19. Uh, pray for the families who have lost loved ones. Uh, please keep those who have contracted the virus uh, in our prayers for a speedy recovery. Uh, please keep our nurses, doctors, and first responders who are dealing with this in your prayers as well. Uh, also, let's keep those who are dealing with the public, um, since we have seen so much reopening in the last few weeks, uh, please keep those people in your prayers as well. Lastly, but not least, uh, I ask for prayer for our country, uh, those grieving over recent events, those who have lost property in the events of the last week, uh, those who uh, are having to keep the peace, we pray for those people that have wisdom and uh, to serve with compassion for those who are uh, grieving and protesting um, peacefully throughout our country. Uh, we also pray for those family members who have lost loved ones recently to uh, police violence and uh, those who have lost loved ones as a result of the actions of the past week. Uh, we ask for the blessings upon this country and this world in the coming days. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. We ask for prayer for our country who is going through, some to some, going through tumultuous times. 
we ask for prayer for Jessica for her to get her voice back and for her to receive a positive test result. We ask for prayer for Dana Neal's father and her goddaughter as they are dealing with medical issues. Uh, we ask for those uh, prayer for the. Uh, we ask for blessings upon those who are in the path of the hurricane coming in the next few days. We also ask for prayer for those who are dealing with COVID-19 and those who have lost loved ones from this horrible disease. Uh, we also ask for prayer for, um, uh, we also have an unspoken prayer request, and we also would ask for prayer for um, our comfort for uh, Bradley Von Tunglin. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace, to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit, taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.